If ministering sometimes feels like an assignment instead of a powerful way to connect, then perhaps we need to rethink our approach. Hi, and welcome to Magnify, an LDS living podcast where we talk about using our influence as followers of Jesus Christ to make a difference in the world. I'm your host, Katherine Davis, a mom, a seminary teacher, and a Traeger enthusiast who loves God. You might have felt stumped before about how to better fulfill your ministering assignments. You're not alone in this thinking. What if we thought differently about what these callings look like? What if we thought of ministry as a tool to help others and ourselves progress? And instead of thinking of intricate ways to serve, we reveled in the nothing moments where we just sit and learn about one another. Emily Snyder calls this the observe, then serve approach to ministering. There's an idea that originated from Linda Burton in a general conference talk from October 2012 titled First Observe, Then Serve. We will link her talk in the show notes. It's a good one. She has been exploring the answers to those very questions, and she wants to know how we can get into people's homes and lives so that our connections grow deep. Her belief is that we can all be a part of one another's progression as we learn how not to minister. Okay. Well, Emily, I'm so excited that you are with us today. Ditto. (laughs) So excited. (laughs) It's going to be so fun. And it's become a tradition on our Magnify podcast to throw some rapid fire questions at our guests so everybody can get to know them a little bit better. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. So I have heard that you are working on 45 dreams before you turn 45 next summer. Yes. And I want to know what dream are you currently working on? Mm, so good. So I oftentimes, it depends on each year because I've been doing it for almost 10 years now, but I sometimes divide them up into chunks of like different things like financial or relationships or skills or whatever. This year, my biggest one is renovating an apartment. <laughs> and that, that was on your so list. I'm a lot of little goals in that <laughs> one of like, oh, who knew that I was going to learn, you know, how much it costs to do wallpaper on just so many little things. So that's been a big, big piece. Another one is I love to travel, but largely I like to travel to be with people or to be by myself. So I have, I know I did a writing (laughs) retreat, like to write by myself. And so I have them planned in February to do another one. And then I'm going to London for Christmas because my little sister lives in London right now. So so I'm going to go hang out with my sis. So there you go. There's three. You only asked one. Oh, I love that. So you started this list 10 years ago? About, it was when when I was 35, almost 36. And so I started at 36. And so you talked about renovating your apartment. So that is my next question for you. Okay. What is a skill that you've learned that you didn't think you could do? Oh. Or that you never want to do again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's be clear. I'm not physically doing the renovations. <laughs> I love Fixer Upper. I will not be that person, but I'm I'm orchestrating people to do it. And there's been some interesting, tough conversations and things. And I realized that like to build a home, whether it's a physical home or a emotional or spiritual, the players get to have shared expectations constant communication and both need to choose to be invested in it. Otherwise it's really hard to create a home, whether it's a physical home or a spiritual home or whatever that thing is in the home sense. So I've learned to find oh, that's positives good. out of some hiccups and <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. And, I and I'm opinionated in a lot of things, but like being sure about my opinions, but also compromising with wise people. Good skills. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew those are good skills? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's my last question. Okay. You lived in New York City for a while. Yes. The city of the best desserts. Oh. So what is a dessert that you can only get in New York that you are missing? That's a good question. But I will, well, okay, I will answer your question, but I might add on to it. Okay. Um, Levain cookies. Always Levain cookies. Always, 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 always. And the Magnolia Bakery chocolate banana pudding. Love. Oh, so good. But I will tell you. I've only had the banana pudding, not the chocolate. 
So we should go. Should I put that on my dream Can list? I, and we put that, go. I'm going to put that on my dream list. Let's okay, do great. it. <laughs> we'll go to New York and get the chocolate magnolia banana pudding. But I will say Waco, Texas has better desserts. Magnolia in Waco, Texas has better desserts than New York City. Sorry. Really? What was your favorite dessert there? Uh, chocolate cake. Chocolate on chocolate cake. And pretty much anything that the Magnolia Bakery and Magnolia Table created was the best I've ever had in my life. So how long did you live in Waco? About two and a half, three years. Yeah. So good dessert lands. I mean, uh, between New York and Waco, I know my cookies and my cakes. <laughs> I love that. Well, I am excited to have a conversation with you today about ministering. And sometimes when we say that word, I think a lot of us are like, oh, ministering, <laughs> because it feels <laughs> like an assignment. Sometimes ministering can feel forced. And sometimes mm -hmm. when we hear that word ministering, we just feel guilty mm -hmm. or we feel a little overwhelmed. But you have this perspective that in order to really minister to others, we need to observe then serve. So what does observe then serve mean to you? Well, let's just be clear, because if anybody is listening, who I've been their ministering sister uh, once upon their lives, um, will probably give me a failing grade. So let's just be clear that like, this is not because I have excellent track record, but I think it's largely because I don't, that I'm trying to wrestle and think about it. And I don't know that I have answers. I just have a lot of thoughts. Yeah. So I think so much of the concept in general, because like you, the feeling inadequate at times, I grew up in a world where my mom was a former school teacher, love it, and she knows how to motivate kiddos. And we had check boxes. We did things in the mornings and we checked them off. But there was also a way that my mom wanted them done. There was a right way to actually get our checkbox. And I think sometimes that's the psyche that as a whole culture, we have looked at in some of the asks that we uh -huh. do as members of like, oh, there's a right way to do something. And I get credit for it if I do it a certain way. Yeah. I think the interesting part about the new concept of ministering, Elder Holland specifically said when he, he was invited to be the one to talk specifics about it in 2018. And he said, however, I warn you, a new name, new flexibility and fewer reports won't make an ounce of difference in our service unless we see this as an invitation to care for one another in a bold, new, holier way. So referring to President Nelson spoke just a couple talks before him. And so the word invitation hmm. is a very different concept to me than assignment. And an invitation feels like an opportunity to, in many ways, observe and serve and to look around and to see who's in my sphere of influence, who's right in front of my face that I can pay attention to in a different way. And that's very different than an assignment. And so those are two kind of different concepts because there's an invitation to minister to each other in our everyday lives of the people that we're interacting with. But then there's also a ward aspect where we're asked to take care of each other. And that sometimes gets trickier because I may be asked or invited because I'm going to edit the word assignment because I love that. Maybe as a child of the millennium, I am like, don't, <laughs> I love agency. I really love agency and I like to choose. So assignment feels really hard for me sometimes. But if I've been invited to think about somebody in my ward, are there different ways I can think about having their world match up with mine so that they are in my world? Does that make sense? That like, yeah, it almost is an invitation because if sister Susie is in a different season of life and our everyday lives are not matching up and I don't naturally see her on a regular basis, that's a level of work to find those channels to actually be a part of her everyday life. Right. But that's, a, that's so much effort and so much work. And so figuring out that balance of all the other things we're invited to care for and to think about and to see is really tricky. So to me, I've kind of separated out this concept of ministering. Who's in my everyday life? Who can I observe and serve with in my everyday realities? And there's a specific invitation to pay attention to somebody in my ward family 
And what are the energies needed to have them be more a part of my daily life so that I can observe more and serve more? So a question, when you felt like ministering was an assignment, did it feel like more of a task? Yeah. And did I, do I fail at that? 100%. Because I feel like I have this idea of what it's supposed to look like. Am I actually going to their house? Am I their best friend? Am I their person they call to in their time of need all the time? I'm not good at that, especially in the changing of life and the different places I've lived in. And just like, I may not be with a person for very long and creating that relationship takes time. So how can I be more proactive? So looking at it as an invitation to maybe forge and deepen relationships. Mm -hmm. And as you've wrestled with this, as you've thought less of a task and more as an invitation, Have you discovered anything more about yourself or about others? Mm, Yeah, that I'm not, I'm not good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that it just, that it, it's a, somebody had a talk a couple of weeks ago about just about opportunities. And I think sometimes some of the saddest funerals I've been to or the saddest passings are when I have realized, wow, that was a relationship. I had an opportunity with that and ended up being a wasted opportunity. Hmm. And I, I mean, back to your your questions of the 44 goals, like the reason why that began was because I was in a situation overseas. I had an incredible experience and I don't know that I took advantage of that opportunity to its fullest. And I realized at the end of it, I never want to waste such an opportunity again. And so I was like, I want to be more deliberate in my life. And so as I've wrestled and continue to wrestle with how do I make this invitation a higher priority in my life, the word opportunity and invitation have resonated so beautifully. Like, am I going to waste this opportunity where the church has created a space for me to connect with this person and this person? Mm. That's an invitation. Yeah. And that's an opportunity of a relationship, whatever that looks like. And that's been what's on my mind a lot and still honestly still wrestling with what that looks like because I'm currently getting to work with a high schooler and a widowed woman that's retired. And so figuring out where our lives actually match up, where we can spend time together, that's a lot of work with busy schedules and very different schedules. But I'm more excited when I think about it as an opportunity and an invitation, then I've got to check it off my box. So how do you do that? (laughs) Well, like, I'm just even thinking of these two people. How are you going about observing then serving? But I do keep thinking about Marco Polo as silly as that is and trying to figure out what are the technology pieces? Like here we are case in point, having a conversation in two different cities and, and technology allows that to happen. So I love, this is not an ad hashtag, not an ad, but (laughs) I love Marco Polo because I feel like some of my sweetest relationships are getting to continue because of technology platforms like Marco Polo, where Hmm. the conversations can continue happening. I have friends from all over the nation and all over the world, based on the different busy schedules, people can be a part of a conversation and it's just rambling at times. And I think for me, the rambling and the nothingness moments, there's a quote from You've Got Mail from Kathleen Kelly. I don't know if you remember that character, but she and Joe Fox are emailing back and forth and she makes a comment, something along the lines of like, all of these nothingness moments have meant more to me than so many somethings. That line has just just really meant a lot as I think about nurturing meaningful relationships because it's the nothingness moments, which for me is really hard to prioritize because I feel like yeah. I want to get things done. And and remembering that the nothingness moments and multiples of those turns into great somethings. And so the Marco Polos, the text messages can be really beautiful relationships, even though they may not be the Liahona pitcher or, you know, that I've baked the casserole because nobody wants to eat that casserole and the hour long conversation that we've all curated. Maybe that's not the right answer because when I've changed it from assignment to invitation, there's no longer a right way to do it. Sorry, I cry. No, I'm not sorry, (laughs) but here's the tears. Well, it's just clear that those nothing moments 
have been impactful and meaningful to you. Mm. What are other ways where you have noticed or tried to have more of those nothing moments? You've mentioned Marco Polo, but are there other times where those nothing moments have built a connection? I remember my one of my first moments I got bold in receiving and visiting teaching at the time. And I was in college and I was so overwhelmed. And I had so much to do. I had so much on my plate. And I wanted to give my visiting teacher at the time, she was so good and wanting to do her visit and come be with me. And I couldn't, like, I just was emotionally, I was like, if I have to stay here and listen to a conversation of us, you know, and, and doing the sometimes funny dance that happens in those of like, yeah. who's in charge, who's leading the conversation? What are we talking about? Like, sometimes when it's so scheduled, it's tricky. At least it has been for me. And I just got brave and said, you know what? I would really love your help to create this thing that I'm making for my students. Like that would be the best help for me right now. And I got bold in the saying what actually was helpful for me. And so she came with me to the copy center and we cut and we then laminated. And it was nothingness moments because... We weren't having a deep spiritual conversation, but I could say, okay, I will let you into my life and I'm needing to accomplish this thing. And I've realized I'm really bad at receiving, really bad. Yeah. And I think that's the other trick that I'm realizing with ministering in the conversation is what does receiving look like? One thought I've thought a lot about is being single and moving back to Utah or just generally in a community that loves family. I felt this way in Waco, Texas as well. It is a very family centric community. I don't have kids. And the instant assumption for most people is a question about my kids. Figuring out how to receive that ask is not a negative. There's this assumption and figuring out how not to be hurt by that assumption, but to receive what they're actually trying to give. If they're trying to get to know me, that's ultimately what they're trying to do. And that's the typical ask in certain communities is about children. Right. In other communities, it's about a career, like whatever it is. But the reality is they're trying to get to know me. And so how do I receive that with what their intent was, regardless of if that's how I anticipated it coming? I just wonder how often am I receiving when somebody thought they were ministering to me or reaching out to me? Did I actually acknowledge that that was happening? And did I actually know how to receive that into my life and take that as, oh, they're trying to invest in me. That is such a gift instead of it, uh, you know, that didn't show up the way I wanted it or I don't need the cookies. Does that make any sense? That's so complicated. No, that totally does. Just trying to understand how people are trying to reach out and make connections and honoring the effort. Yes. Honoring that effort. Yes, yes. And not thinking it has to look a certain way. And I think that's the other tricky part. In this whole transition, it was a very formulaic of like, it was once a month back in the day. It was show up in their homes. There was a message and a guided conversation that was supposed to happen. So like we knew exactly like this is a home and visiting teaching conversation. Yeah. They have done it. I know how to receive it. The tricky part with ministering of there are no boxes to check anymore. There's no right way to do it means it's trickier to recognize when I've been ministered to, whether by my assigned people or not. Are people ministering to me? Like I dream of a lot of different worlds (laughs) that we could create, (laughs) but I wonder if there's ever a world where we don't have assignments and I dream of that world. I hope we can become a people that don't need assignments. And so I've been like, well, what could be a baby step? And so I've thought about questions because I'm a nerd. This is what somebody does. No, because I've thought about that so much as well. Okay, good. We can be nerds together. <laughs> this makes me so happy. Because why, obviously, like, how could we move past an assignment or an invitation? I like the word invitation. Right. And that feels like a baby step. I really ultimately dream of like that never needing to exist. It feels like training wheels. Yeah, And so what are we ultimately trying to get to? And as a community, what's our true goal? And so here are some of my questions. Do you feel watched over by the members in your ward? Period. Regardless of who it is, like, do you Hmm. feel like there are members in your ward or your neighborhood even? Do you feel you could turn to someone in your neighborhood or ward in a time of trouble or need? I don't care who it is. I just want to know, do you know that somebody will come to your aid? 
do you feel like you have a friend in the ward? And again, I don't care if they're one and the same. Like, I just wonder if there's a world that that could happen. And then as far as giving and these ones kicked me, do you feel that you invest in those around you? Do you feel that people would call you in times of trouble and need? And that one, I was like, okay, Emily Snyder, you've got some work to do. Cause I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know what moments right? that people would, somebody would call me cause it's made me really analyze like, how am I showing up? And I think that's what the phrase observe then serve teaches me mm -hmm. that it's not about me, that the focus needs to be outward and yeah. how am I showing up for others? Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, how am I receiving how they show up for me? I have a dear friend. She made a comment the other day yeah. when I was just in a tizzy and she said, I think it's really interesting that we will never truly get to receive the love that we give. And I was like, okay, tell me more. This was in a Marco Polo. Again, not an ad. <laughs> but, but as I like followed up and was like, tell me more. And just the reality of like, I give to people and I invest in people the way I want somebody to invest in me. And I show up in ways and I have the conversations that I wish yeah. people would ask and show up for me. But reality is that may not at all be how my dad gives love or investment because he's caring about other things that he right. wished other people would care about for him. So that's what he's giving. And so how do I translate the givings into my receiving? And I'm sometimes not very good at receiving. Yeah. I don't know that we as a people are. I actually have a neighbor, my really good friend, Brittany, who I think taught me a little bit about this observe than serve. She kind of observed, I think for a while, me and my needs and my busy life. And then she just asked, Hey, do you just want to go get a diet Coke? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yes. <laughs> Cause that's what I need. Right? Like that's yeah. what I needed yeah. is just get in the car for 10 minutes, grab a diet Coke. But that took her noticing what I needed. And yeah. that took her looking outward. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think figuring out, like I often think about like literally the roads I drive, what are my patterns? Those are the people I'm going to see in my everyday life. And how do I get new people into those patterns or those roads that I'm driving? I may have to take a different road somewhere if I'm going to accomplish something different. And so how do I get people in there? And her realizing, okay, your road, the things you're doing how does she wiggle her way into that in soft little ways, I think is so, so powerful. I think it's also a concept of figuring out what progress people are trying to make. Yeah. So that's my question is you talk about how ministering is a way to help others in their progression, which is such an important way to look at ministering rather than an assignment. It's an invitation mm -hmm. to help others progress. So how do you see ministering helping in that? Again, let's just, I can just imagine my neighbor who, what anybody that I've been currently assigned to has been like, why is she talking? She hasn't, she's not good at this in my life. And I'm like, I know, but every once in a while I show up for somebody. Okay. Same here though. Yeah, and I'm just grateful for people that are really gracious. Conceptually, it's this really interesting idea of like, what's the point? And I remember as a missionary thinking, oh, this thing that I'm doing as a missionary is ultimately what we're invited to do as visiting and home teachers at the time ministering today of like, we're, we're trying to care for people. We're trying to actually invite them to come into Christ. And a friend shared with me verses in Acts, and this is where Paul is teaching King Agrippa, and he's recounting his experience when the Savior appeared to him. And it's in Acts 26, and it says, and I said, who art thou, Lord, when the Lord appeared to him and told him to stop persecuting? Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. And then he keeps talking and says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. The key pieces in this account of the Savior appearing to Paul, he was told to arise. And the reason why the Savior appeared to him was to make Paul a minister and a witness of Jesus Christ, to, to have others turn from darkness to light, for people to turn from the power of Satan unto God that they can have a forgiveness of their sins. 
that was also a powerful thing of like, oh, that is the point. The point is to have nothingness moments, to be in somebody's life where I can witness of my relationship with Jesus Christ. They can witness of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And can we move each other forward wherever we're at in our relationship, but also in our life progression? Like maybe the conversation for the young woman that I get to, that I get to kick it with, <laughs> I adore her, is that she's trying to figure out college applications. Maybe the conversation in the moment isn't about Jesus Christ. Maybe it's about where she's at in her life and the struggles that she's trying to overcome. Is it college? Is it friends in the moment and friend anxiety? Is it guys? Is it, I mean, whatever those pieces are, what is it that people are on their paths trying to overcome? And that may not be where I am and I may not be able to help a ton, but like I can cheerlead where they're at on their paths and I have no idea where their paths are going, but is there a world that I can minister and have the nothingness moments to then get to witness of God's power, whether it is because of my own experiences, truly testifying to him. I, like who knows what that looks like in the moments, but that was such a powerful reality of like, oh, there's so many ways to witness. Well, I just think that is such an exciting way for me to look at it is that I am being invited to help others progress in their journey to Jesus Christ. He's inviting me to be a part of his work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an opportunity. Yes. And what can I learn in the process? Yeah. Even as you're saying that, I'm thinking, I mean, that's what I live for every day. So what right? makes this so tricky sometimes? But I wonder if for me, I get really tired of scheduling things. I get really, really tired. Whether it's a full-time job at a home with kiddos and you're navigating all those pieces or in a office space with Outlook calendars and trying to match up. There's a lot of scheduling that we do. And the scheduling piece sometimes can get cumbersome Yeah, to do this good thing of like, gosh, I can't tell you how many texts have gone back and forth of like, what about this? What about here? What about, and sometimes it's just like, oh my gosh, trying to figure out the coordination piece is exhausting, let alone to get to the nothingness conversations to have the meaningful ones. Like trying right? to figure out our lives to match them up is so overwhelming. I mean, so for me, I love Marco Polo, but like, what are other ways that we can do that? And like, that is a question I want to ask in prayer of what does that look like for these people I have been invited to interact with? Notice how I said, I'm going to not, I have. <laughs> Great. Just want to make that clear. Oh, I love that because I think we all sometimes feel that we're not the best at ministering, but it reminded me of a quote from Elder Woodso, and he said this, In our pre-existent state, in the day of the great council, we made a certain agreement with the Almighty. The Lord proposed a plan conceived by him. We accepted it. Since the plan is intended for all men, we became parties to the salvation of every person under that plan. We agreed mm. right then and there to be not only saviors for ourselves, but measurable saviors for the whole human family. I love that. And for me, that instantly tells me a little bit different of the ministering to the people in my everyday life that I'm in Walmart or as I'm driving or whatever it is. Like, am I observing? Am I paying attention to the person at the checkout that is not feeling so great? And can I just be a warm smile and gracious? Like, in those little moments of the people that I don't know, or maybe that I do, because sometimes I wonder, do we forget the ministering in our own homes? What are those conversations? Which is a different conversation than the watch care in my ward. And that quote yeah. reminds me of that, of like, this is not an assignment conversation. Yes, we have a watch care in our ward, but the ministering to the whole human race, I get to be an example of that. I get to showcase to the world my generosity and my graciousness and my boundaries and my whatever, because I know Jesus Christ. I think that's why I love it. And I think you're right. Like I bristle a little at the term assignment and I don't want to be an assignment to somebody else. I think that's yeah my big thing. But yeah. when we look at that quote and that overall picture is that we covenanted and we promised in the preexistence to lift and to help and to serve. And if I can look at it as more of an invitation to help others progress, mm -hmm. then maybe that can help change my view of, of ministering, that it is really about 
progression and that as we really get into people's homes and get into their lives and see where we can fit and maybe where a need is, we can serve them. We can start to learn things that might break down assumptions about them and about ourselves. Don't you think? Yeah. So I, I got an MBA and it was really funny because a classmate said his girlfriend was trying to figure out master's degrees and wanted to pick my brain. And at the end of the conversation, she went back to her boyfriend and said, the only answer she really felt strong about was getting an MBA. And I was like, because that's the choice that I made. <laughs> like, of course, that's why I felt like, of course, I feel strongly about that because that's the decision that was best for my life. Right. And so if if you're going to ask my opinion, this is how I've come to my opinion. But I think we as a people, but also me, very particular, that is a hard spot to separate and say, Catherine, if you were going to ask me questions, can I really step away from what I think the right answer is? Because that was a choice I made. And to say, I don't know, what is the best choice for you? And let's, let's analyze that because I have my biases. I have the biases of like, this is how I've chosen to live my life. So of course, I think this is the best way to do it. Right. But that may not be your best way. And how can I separate your progress path that is going to be very, very different than my progress path? What does that look like? Yet knowing all of those paths lead to Christ and they they always are invited to lead to Christ. So how can I help that while at the same time respecting your progress is going to look very different. The MBA may not be the right answer for you. And that's okay. Yeah. And I think sometimes our assumptions of others are what prevent us from really ministering. Ooh, tell tell me more. (laughs) I want to know more about that. I don't disagree. (laughs) Well, I just think I see this every day in my classroom, right? I have quickly learned to try and not have preconceived notions when students Mm -hmm. come into my class, especially new students every semester when I get 160 new teenagers. I can quickly put them in into categories. I totally could. And then I have had so many experiences where as I've spent more time with them, those categories I put them in are completely wrong. Totally. And I have learned more about their hearts and what they need and how Christ is working in their lives when I've been able to move past my assumptions. Totally. And yet it's a human functionality. I worked for a man that would talk about God is the master accountant because he doesn't need categories. Like we have to categorize things because we're not capable of having hundreds and hundreds of different categories and letting everybody and keep track of everything. But yeah. God doesn't need that. He, he can see us all individually and not have to combine to keep track of things. So I think it's a very natural human reality, but amen, amen. I remember a a teacher I used to teach with, he said, Emily, you were the kind of person that in college, I assumed you always had dates. I would never, I never would have asked you out because I assumed you always had dates. And I was like, that's so fun because I didn't have any. (laughs) But just that idea of like, so fascinating because then I didn't get to go out with the guy like the guy I was teaching with because he assumed That you already had a date. I would never get a chance. And I'm like, and I never got to go with you because you never asked. Like, ouch, that's hard for all of us. I just think right now, Emily, like if somebody were to say to me, oh, your new ministering assignment is Emily. I'd be like, well, she has it all together. Like, what am I going to do? She, she has this great job. Everything's great. She doesn't need me. Those would be my assumptions. And I'd say that's so fun. (laughs) Like, you're cray cray. You are cray cray. (laughs) But that's where I think our assumptions prevent us from helping others in their progression. I think that's why the concept of receiving has been really interesting to me Hmm. is because figuring out what I can give uniquely, I'm not going to be the person anybody in my ward will ever call for a casserole. But I do know that they will know I can give really well in other areas. And then consequently, where am I receiving? Am I receiving somebody trying to come into my life? Somebody asking to go for a Diet Coke? Like, am I actually receiving that invitation? Am I receiving the well-meaning asks that sometimes I don't want to answer? Sometimes we do think we have it all put together. And sometimes 
we have a very specific thing we want to receive from somebody in our lives. And that makes it really, really hard to then actually not only receive their love, but the love of the Lord that he may be at times trying to say, I have planted this person to make this comment or this person to minister to you for this specific thing. And if you won't let him or her in, I can't answer that prayer for you. Like that's so hard for a community that we are taught all the time to give, 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 give. Has there been a time where you have received someone's offering and it has led you closer to Jesus Christ or given you an answer at a time where you've needed it? Yeah. Uh, When I uh, first moved home back to Utah, there was a lot of like, I didn't know where I was going to live. I thought just I was going to camp out at my parents' house for a little bit and then figure something out. A little bit turned into two plus years. So great. Love it. Really love it so much. <laughs> and, but two women in my ward were invited to be my ministers and they were persistent in a busy season and in a season I was pretty lost and they were so persistent. And who knows what they ever said? Literally, that's where the the nothingness means so much because they both ditched me and went on a mission, <laughs> a single <laughs> Single um, older women, they dished me for a year. And when they came back, like I literally was like in hysteric sobs. I was just so excited that these women that had just chosen to keep knocking at my door and wiggling into my independent heart, like really kept trying. I think that's beautiful, right? And, and as I look at ministering that way, that's who I want to be. But it takes so much work. And I think that was so much effort on their part. And I'm sometimes not good at the effort of getting into people's lives. So what can we do to work that effort into our busy schedules? And I like how you said in natural paths. And what can we do to observe then serve? Yeah. Well, and for me, I feel like it. I like to take credit <laughs> where I can. And I think dis- distinguishing there is a ministering to the worldwide and to mankind, to the your beautiful quote. And I I don't have to feel like a failure at ministering because I do think I do an okay job in some of these. Hmm. And can I do a better job at my ward invitation? Yes. And can I see that more as an opportunity? And that is going to take perhaps a different level of work and creativity that I can pray for specifically. But I think in order to truly move to a higher and holier option, I don't get to feel like a failure. Like that's unacceptable. And so I'm never going to succeed when I feel like a failure. And so recognizing all the places I am ministering really well, all the areas that I do observe and serve, are they family members? Are they coworkers? Are they people that I am already serving in callings with? We as a people are some of the most giving, most gracious, beautiful people because anybody that has chosen to connect their life with Christ and with God are good people at their core. And so how do we recognize and give ourselves credit for the things that we are doing really, really beautifully well? And yes, does it take a different level of energy and work on maybe some invitations that are out of our everyday lives? Yeah, but I'm not failing. I'm not failing in the holistic conversation and the principle of ministering to mankind. I love that. Right. And if that's one thing that we can hear is we're not failing. And whether we serve in our homes or at work or wherever that is, we're still ministering. And the invitation is to look for more ways to minister in our ward and to help others progress and come closer to Jesus Christ, to really be his hands. And to witness. I mean, that doesn't mean it's a casserole. I can witness without a casserole. I can witness of his love without cookies and without a monthly treat dropped off. I can witness in lots of different ways. And that doesn't mean those are bad ways. That can be a witness too. Right? Okay, Emily. Yes, ma'am. One of our main goals here on Magnify is to leave the conversation with a small and simple suggestion. Mm. So we've been talking a lot about ministering and the invitation, switching that, not an assignment, but an invitation. What would you say is your small and simple action or idea that we can apply for how not to minister or to observe then serve? Yeah. I mean, it can be an invitation for anybody, but this is for me. (laughs) So if anybody (laughs) wants to join me in it, that's great. 
But for me, my takeaways are that I want to pray to take advantage of the opportunity of the invitation in my word specifically. And I want to be more aware of receiving the ministering that I am given from everybody in my life. I love that. I'm going to work on that. Thanks for being here with us today, Emily. You can find Emily's work on Instagram at Snyder M E M. And don't forget to join us over on Instagram at Magnify Community. And of course, subscribe and listen to the Magnify podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks for being here and let's meet up again next week.